And hey everybody, welcome back to Bible Fun with the Duns. Today, our chapter that we read was Solomon, Song of Solomon, chapter number five. Now let me go ahead. Right, let me go ahead and get you into what's happening in this passage. So if you look at verse number one, verse number one is divided really into two parts. The first part has four little, four little, you know, sentences. Uh, and then there's a second part that says, it, it says, it just says to his friends. That's the subheading of that. Now, here's what's happening. In the first four lines, this is basically their wedding night in a, uh, in metaphor. Now, if you took the Hebrew of this, all the Hebrew letters and the words and the sentence structure, this one section right here, verse one of chapter five is the center of the Hebrew word count of this book which means the wedding night that they spend together is the exact middle of this book. Hinge but point. now, I want you to see what it says next. It says this. It says, Eat, O friends, drink, yes, drink deeply, O beloved one. So this is this is the metaphor of the intimacy of their, their, their wedding night. But within marriage, this is not something that anybody in this book is ashamed about. All right? So here's what's weird, though. So now you have this, you, you have this unknown, unnamed friend who is commenting about what's going on in their wedding night. So these three lines are basically comments from an unknown narrator in this story who seems to celebrate their, their wedding, and he is unseen, but he's present because he knows what's happening. He's present in the marriage covenant, and he calls them friends. Who is this? Well, in poetic terms, this is God. This is God who's watched their relationship develop. He's seen them get married. He's part of their marriage. And now he's celebrating them in their wedding night. And so you've got this, you got this, this, I mean, it's, it is what it is. The rest of this chapter is basically another dream sequence where, where the, the Shulamite, the bride, is having a dream really about a fight that, that her and her husband have early on in their marriage. And then, and you can, and you kind of see the flow of it. Now, the way you can tell that it's a, that it's a dream is that the comments that she makes, for instance, she makes a comment like this. She said, you know, I went around town and I couldn't find him. He was gone. Nobody had seen him. And then there were some guards. They saw me, they beat me up. Okay. Well, just ask yourself some reasonable questions. So if the queen of the country decides to take a, take a stroll at night, do you think anybody's letting her out of the palace with at least a bodyguard? No. You think some of the soldiers who, everybody knows the queen, you think they're going to catch her and beat her up in an alley? No. So what's this happening? There is emotional turmoil going on. She's in a battle inside. Why? Because, because her and her groom are at odds. They're, they're going through one of their first fights in marriage, and then they, they work their way out of it, which is, in, which is instructive in this book. Because remember, they're the seasons of a marriage. So at church yesterday, we talked about fall. We talked about spring. Spring is when everything's new. Uh, fall is when things start to kind of slip through the cracks. And then there are those moments where things can get hot or cold at home, depending on uh, kind of the circumstances of it all. So this is, this is them kind of in a dream sequence of maybe, maybe one of their first fights. Horrible. Push. We don't give him enough attention. No. Okay. What you got? So I really, we had dinner and we read it as a family and I oh wish gosh. I could put a camera on, on us. I read it in the, uh, what is this? Uh, yeah, Christian CSB, Standard. CSB. And then I read it in the Passion Translation and my kids are looking at me, Jeb's words, and I quote, I got nothing. <laughs> John's words were, I got half of nothing. He said, I got half of nothing. And then also he had commentary like, um, they said that Jesus' miracles were would be enough to fill all the books in the whole world if they were written down. We probably could have put some of that in here instead. <laughs> it's still the song is all here. And you know what? I have been there. Like, honestly, up until this time through, I haven't seen tons of value to me. I have not taken it personally. Um, but I don't know. The Lord is faithful, and just continue to let your eyes fall on every word, and and read and allow God to reveal Himself to you. And so, 
to to piggyback on what Dusty said, also, can I just tell you how many times Dusty's singing, "Baby, lock the doors and turn the lights down low." I, okay, all right. Be honest. Who, who's singing that? Okay, song? it's you, not me. You started it. You got it in my head. You okay, did start all right, it. All right, all okay. right. You sing it like a thousand times. <laughs> well, because today it's unlock the doors and turn the lights. Okay. Down. Okay. So my what God. I see, Dusty doesn't uh, talk about this. So he's modest and I'm less. Okay. All right. Go. Go. So, in this chapter, um, what I see is yes, the things that we can take at face value with the the Shulamite and Solomon. But also remember, I'm reading it and I'm leaning into the allegory of the relationship that we have, the church has, with Christ. And so, as I look at that, I see relationship with God in this story. I see. Um, maybe the Shulamite here getting mad at Solomon for something. I've been there. I don't know if you've been there in your relationship with God. Maybe something in your life happens to you and you think, hold on, I don't deserve this. Or hold on, this isn't the way it was supposed to be. Or I disagree with you, God, for giving me this lot. And for some reason, it puts a, a halt on your relationship. It puts... Uh, distance between you and God because you're in a situation where um, you don't understand. And so because of that, maybe you harden your heart to him. And so what I see here, if we continue on this theme of the pursuit of chapters one and two and, and God calling us out and saying, come, come go with me, join me in this journey, get rid of the sly foxes, get rid of anything that separates us. And then she uh, pushes him away and says, not yet, but then tries to do life on her own in the beginning of chapter three and is completely miserable. She goes through what, what I read in something, they call it the dark night of the soul. Doing life, knowing God, and then trying to do life without him is the most miserable thing you can go through. Yeah, I've heard somebody say, the most miserable person you'll find is not the lost person, it's the backslidden Christian. Absolutely, yeah. and if you've been there, you get that. And so then what we see in chapter three is she learns what it looks like to do life without God. And when he continues to pursue her because he's so faithful and so good like that, he never stops. He seeks her out. And when she finds him, when she seeks him and finds him, because she seeks him with her whole heart, she finds him and she clings to him. She says, I'm never going to let him go. But we also know what relationship is. So they get married. They have this marriage picture, this picture of the complete, maybe salvation, the complete joining of relationships of God and the church or God and me. Um, and so then we see the beauty of what that is, what it is to do life with God, what it, how beautiful life can be when we are living in his will and when we are abiding and clinging to him. But then as we keep going, other foxes come and creep in. Other sin comes and creeps in. Who knows what's going on here that causes this rift between um, her and Solomon or us and God. Um, and honestly, we can all fill in the blank with our own things that we've been through. But because of that, once again, she's pushing him away. She's hardening her heart to him. She... Uh, this is just the perfect picture of real life in walking in relationship with God. And again, God never stops pursuing. He continues to knock on that door. He continues to seek her out. And I think we see beautiful things in this scripture that if we're not looking just at face value, um, we can learn even more about God. So we got a little side eye action here when she says she had taken off her garment but there's more to that. And I want to read um, something that the Passion Translation talks about with garments. And, and it may resonate with you, um, other scripture that you've read about garments. Garments in the Bible are frequently used as a picture of righteousness. Filthy garments are a symbol of unrighteousness or self-righteousness. Clean white garments are a picture of the righteousness of Christ. Laying aside her garments is, some, is a symbolic picture of what happens when we come to know Jesus as Savior. We lay aside our self-righteousness, take up his garments of true righteousness. Remember, the best that we can do, all of our righteousness is filthy rags if we do that on our own. And so he pursues her and she comes to a place where she, she wants him. And so she recognizes that 
And so she has to go seek after him. He's a gentleman and he's waiting for her. It's that picture in Isaiah 65 that I can't unsee anymore of, of Jesus waiting with his arms open wide. And so she's looking for him and she sees her friends and she's like, if you see him, if you see my God, tell me, let me know. If you see Solomon, let me know. And so the friends, what she recognizes since she's in relationship with him, nothing else will do. No substitute we can put in the place, no idol, nothing that we try to fill that need or that hole with is going to do other than God. And so she is looking for him and these people that she's saying, where are they? Uh, where is he? They want to know like, what makes him so special? What makes him, why can't you just find someone else? What makes him stand out? And so I can't help but see this picture of when we find God, number one, we should recognize and we will recognize that no one else, no thing else will do in our relationships. Um, but also others should see our love for him and our love for him will, will strike them. And they're going to want to know like, why, why do you love this God so much? What makes you seek after him? What makes what you choose to live your life like every day, what makes it different from, say, the way other people choose to live? And then finally, she tells them what it is that she loves about him, and it's precious. It's verses 10 through 18. The rest of this chapter, she lists what she loves about him, how he stands out, how he's the best of the best. And what I see here is a picture of her remembering. And so I see this is as an important thing at face value in marriage. When Dustin and I, like, we go on road trips alone or something, sometimes we'll reminisce about the good old days, dating, um, just getting to know each other. In fact, we just took a trip to um, Dusty's brother's wedding, and we got to pass our, um, our first apartment. Dusty was dorm director at our college, and it's so fun just to remember the good old days. But when you remember that, it reignites your love for each other. It reignites the passion. And that is exactly why God teaches us all through scripture. He tells his people, remember, don't forget, remember. And so as she's going through verses 10 through 18, I can't help but see. She's remembering what she loves about Solomon. She's remembering what they've been through. She remembers their relationship. She remembers the Twitter-pated feelings of chapters one and two. When we do that with our own life, look back at God's pursuit of you. Look at how he drew you to him in relationship. Think of your salvation experience. Think of how fiery and passionately you followed him after your salvation. When you remember that, it reignites your love for him. It, re it, it makes anything that you had hardened your heart over, it makes it fall away. It puts it in perspective and you realize that was really dumb. This God loves me, and whatever I had against him, whatever I didn't understand, he is so much better than that. I can trust him because of all of this, verses 10 through 18. So, I love, I'm actually loving this well, book. Well, good, well, good. Well, good. All right, so we'll I see you tomorrow. Nothing. Yeah, we'll see you tomorrow in chapter number six. All right, bye. bye. I do. It's